All right. Well, thanks for the support. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, also, welcome to all of the people who are joining us online today. Um, I will give you in the next 30 minutes an introduction to Easy. For some of you, that will be uh, well, pretty easy material. You already know a lot about it. For others, it might be new. Um, but for the people for whom it's not new, bear with us. We'll have a lot more technical talks also tomorrow that go a lot more in depth and also later this afternoon. So <coughs> if you do, didn't already do this yet, uh, please join us on Slack. Uh, we have a special channel set up for this meeting. It's hashtag community-meeting-2022. Uh, and there you can also ask your questions. Of course, you can also join the, uh, the Zoom link and ask questions there if you're on the YouTube. Uh, I, th I guess you can also give a chat there, right? And then somebody will shout it out in the room. All right, so who am I? My name is Kasper van Leeuwen. I work in the high performance computing and the high performance machine learning teams of SURF. Uh, I joined SURF five years ago, and SURF is the Dutch National Supercomputing Institute. Uh, so basically, what we do is we support Dutch universities uh, with all kinds of IT services, not just supercomputing, it's much broader than that. Uh, but that's the part that I'm involved in personally. Um, so we host Stanleyus, which is the Dutch national supercomputer, and we host a lot of different other systems as well. Uh, you can have a look at the website if you're interested. So as I said, this talk, it will cover a little bit of the why and the how of EASY, uh, but it will not go into a lot of depth. So this is something, uh, if you've ever done scientific software installations, you know that it can be very challenging. Um, well, here's a lot of a whole comic collection. Um, scientific software takes a lot of time to install, right? Which can be a great excuse to get coffee, but eventually you also want to get some work done and you're waiting for this installation to finish. Um, you're lucky if it finishes in one go, right? There's usually something to debug, something that doesn't work. Uh, your system that's a little bit different than what people expected it to be. And uh, yeah, you need to figure that out. Um, there's a very nice talk uh, from Kenneth also here in the room about how to make package managers cry. If you want to have a laugh, ha have a look if this one is still online somewhere. I guess it is. So yeah, software deployment can be a real issue. And uh, um, it's actually very challenging with large computer systems like ours. So what we have at Surf, we have, well, a couple of hundred, maybe a thousand active users. Uh, users. And of course, they come with a lot of requests, right? A lot of people who want uh, stuff to be inst installed. Maybe they cannot do it themselves. They need help or they want it to be centrally installed. Uh, and what we're actually seeing over the past few years is that we're getting more and more users. And uh, actually, they have less and less experience with deploying software because they come from a broader group of, uh, of users. So in the past, it used to be a lot of the chemistry and physics people who had a pretty strong background in computer science anyway. Uh, but now we're seeing a, a whole new user group, also more the humanities sciences, who are not really familiar with these types of systems, who are not familiar with the software deployment, who are not familiar with Linux systems in general sometimes. Uh, and through that we see the effort that we have to spend to get people on the system, to get them to run their program. We see that effort going up and up. Um, aside from that, there's more software around, also because of the uh, increasing amount of user communities that we serve. Of course, these user communities also create software themselves. So there's more variation than what we used to have uh, five or 10 years ago. And we see a very big increase in the variety in hardware. So uh, of course, we almost had Intel CPUs. Uh, we used to have PowerPC. Now we see AMD CPUs back on the rise again. Uh, there's ARM coming up. Uh, there's the RISC-V processor architecture coming up. There's different types of accelerators. So all in all, this whole hardware ecosystem is also getting more and more complex. Um, and that tends to be challenging for your software installations as well, because uh, yeah, your software needs to support this hardware. Uh, you need to tell it to co compile with the right libraries. Maybe you have multiple types of hardware in your system. Um, and all in all, that makes it pretty difficult to do software installations for your users. Another thing that we see is uh, a lot more people using the cloud. Um, of course, Microsoft Azure actually uh, uh, offers HPC resources in the cloud as well. Uh, Amazon, Google, Oracle, etc. A lot more researchers also turn to the cloud nowadays, but there, of course, they need to also do a lot more themselves. So also the software deployment, uh, they tend to need to do themselves there, and that is sometimes challenging for them. 
The biggest problem of all, I guess, is that all of this increasing complexity, it doesn't come with increasing manpower, right? The HPC teams are uh, usually still the same way they were 10 years ago in terms of size, and, uh, but we're getting a lot more questions. So this is somehow what triggered for us uh, uh, the moment where we said, okay, we need, to, we need to do something clever here. We need to make this process more efficient, how we do software deployment and how we can share that effort with other people in the community who face this issue. <coughs> so yeah, how can we do this in a smarter way? Um, and actually, I have a much better slide after this one, because uh, it started with a meeting that was organized by Dell, but I have a much better history slide. I think it's this one, yes. Um, so it started in 2019 uh, with a meeting of the University in Groningen, TU Delft, TU Eindhoven, the VU Amsterdam, the University of Cambridge, and it was organized by Dell Technologies. And they also together recognize this, this problem, right? How do you do software deployment? We see that this takes more and more effort and how do you do this in an efficient way? And the outcome of that initial meeting was, okay, you know, we see this problem, we recognize it, we need to do something together on this. And they created the Scientific Software Repository for Cluster Computers, SSR4CC. And that was followed up with a meeting in Groningen in 2020 and later in March of 2020 in Delft. That's also where uh, Kenneth, the main developer of EasyBuild, got invited. Um, and this is kind of where the effort started to grow. So um, a, a joint effort was started, we called it Easy. And sort of right after this period is also where Surf got involved. Um, and it really took off with Kenneth giving a public talk at a HPCKP conference, uh, which fueled a lot of interest on this, this Easy initiative. Um, of course, we've had Corona since then, so uh, it's been a bit of a, a slow period in meeting other people, but now finally we have the time to be here together, so I'm very happy that we have, uh, well, we have about 20 people in the room now, so that's great. Um, and it's a great excuse to, uh, to meet up and to actually get to know each other better and discuss these types of issues. Um, since the project started, a lot of people showed their interest. Uh, as you see here, there's a lot of logos in here. Uh, some people are more involved than others, of course, um, depending mostly on how much time people have to spend. Uh, but it, what it shows is that there's a broad interest, right? It's not just HPC, uh, it's also the, the main cloud providers that are interested. Um, it's, uh, um, it's uh, how do you call this? Well, CERN is not an initiative, it's not a company, it's a research organization, right? Anyway, big centers that are involved here. So what is EASY and what is our scope? What do we want to achieve? Um, EASY stands for the European Environment for Scientific Software Installations. And what we aim to do is to build a shared software repository of optimized, and that's a, a key word that I'm going to focus on later on as well, of optimized scientific software installations. And what we, tend to, what we try to achieve here is to avoid this duplicate work that we've all been doing in the HPC community, right? We've all been managing software environments on our own clusters, sometimes on multiple clusters to make it even worse. And we're trying to get that duplication out to reduce the amount of effort. Uh, and we want to do that by collaborating on one shared software stack. Um, and that was sort of the original trigger of saying, okay, this is why we need it, right? But when you have something like this, you can see uh, a lot of other use cases as well and a lot of other benefits as well. So also for the users, uh, it's a very nice uh, way of using software because you can have the same software environment on a lot of different systems. Um, and this goes from your local laptop to a cloud node to your actual HPC system. Um, and you have the same uniform environment. So the requirement here is that we should make a software environment that works at least on any Linux OS, uh, but possibly also Mac OS and the Windows sus subsystem for Linux, uh, that all should work. <coughs> As I said, we have focus on performance. Of course, yeah, the initiative was started by HPC centers, so there is a focus on performance. Um, but we also want to look into automation. If we want to make this a community effort, we need to have some automation in place in order to be able to process community contributions. So that is something we're actively looking into. Uh, testing becomes very important. If you have one central software stack that everybody uses, it better work right, because uh, otherwise a lot of users are going to suffer. And of course, we need to have this active collaboration, right? So we need to put in some effort there. 
So as I said, I want to talk a little bit about performance. Um, and already here in the room this morning, Kenneth gave it away a little bit in the discussion. Um, optimizing your software for the hardware that you have, and especially the, the microarchitecture that you have, can really give you substantial benefits, especially for scientific software that is well optimized, that can benefit from vectorized operations, or that can benefit from other recent instruction sets that have been put out there. Um, it's very important that you tell your compiler to use those instructions because otherwise you're losing performance that you can, could potentially have. And here in this graph, you can see how much of a big difference it is between just some, well, if you optimize for a ba very basic instruction set like SSE, uh, compared to uh, AVX 512, if your processor uh, has the capability to run AVX 512 instructions, there's almost a 70% speed up, right? So that, that's huge. You don't want to leave that on the table. That's a waste of hardware resources. Now, this is an example for Gromex, but it goes for a lot of scientific software. <clears throat> so, as I said, one of the main reasons to start this effort is to avoid duplicate work, right? Right now, everybody, well, we try to use build tools to make our life a little bit easier. So, some people are using spec, some people are using easy build. Uh, some people are also still doing manual installations. Um, and... Well, the build tools like Spec and EaseBuild at least allow us to share a little bit of the effort, right? Because we can share essentially build recipes. But then because the systems are still different, uh, we still run into different issues while we're trying to install our software. Um, so it doesn't always work out of the box. And that's what we really want to tackle with Easy, right? One common software stack and all contribute to that software stack. Um, another thing, if you want to move from one system to another now, so from the user point of view, um, I'm working on my local laptop, I've developed a, a nice code, and I'm debugging it on my laptop, it finally works, and now I want to run a, a full-scale simulation, I need to move it to an HPC system. Right now, that means I have to start installing my software there, that usually takes quite a bit of effort and time from the researcher, or they will put in a request with the HPC help desk and say, hey, I need this piece of software installed, it might be a different version than what they used on the local laptop. It might be slightly different compiled with different options and therefore work a little bit differently compared to their laptop. And it can get it can take quite a long time before a user can actually start to work on uh, on this system. Of course, on top of that, they also need to move the data, but the data is usually not the most difficult part, right? If you want to move from one system to another. Um, if this user were to use Easy, then it would be much nicer because you have one common software environment. The only thing you need to still care about is moving the data. And that's much, much faster to do. All right, that the whole promise sounds great, right? I hope I sold this a little bit, but uh, how do we then achieve this? Well, there's a couple of key ingredients that we need. So one is a way to, if we want to build one software stack and use it anywhere, we need a way to distribute that software stack globally. Then we need some abstraction from the host OS, because if you want to run it on any system you want, uh, yeah, you need some type of abstraction. It cannot depend on the host OS. Um, we want optimized builds, uh, because we want to make the most performance out of the system, right? So this is basically referring to the, the Gromax graph that you saw. And then we want a way that at runtime, you select the right architecture for the machine that you are running on, the right optimization, uh, and that is then the binary that you get. And ideally, this selection would happen automatically. So for all of those steps, we actually took uh, components. Um, the first is CERN VMFS. So CERN VMFS is a, uh, well, it's, it's a file system which gets distributed online. It's originally developed for uh, the worldwide computing grid in order to get software to the grid nodes, which could be anywhere, right? So that is also, they basically had the same problem already 20, 30 years ago, I don't know when they started developing CERN VMFS, but a long time ago. Um, and this can help you to distribute this worldwide. And of course, they also took care of thinking about, okay, how does that perform? I think we have some more technical slides on that later on. Then about the abstraction layer. Um, again, we need to abstract from the host OS. Here we use Gen2 Prefix. Gen2 Prefix is essentially uh, a Linux installation that you can do in a custom prefix. Um, and the way in which we, we use that, it's not altogether very different from containers, right? Containers also have a container OS that provides isolation from the host. In a sense, this is very, this is very comparable. So if you understand how a container works, then this is not all that much different. 
Um, of course, we want optimized builds, right? As I already mentioned. Well, there we use easy build, uh, but in theory, we could have used any of the HPC uh, software installation tools out there. So spec would also have been uh, a valid option. And finally, there's the selection at runtime. So uh, we need to figure out which machine are we running on and which version of the stack fits best with that machine. So even if we don't have that exact, arch that exact architecture in there, of course, you need to pick a version of the stack um, yeah, which contains instructions that are all supported on your current node. And for that, we use ArchSpec. And in principle, all of this stuff is open source. So putting all of that together, and this is a much more busy slide, you see that there's more and more components coming in, right? Putting all of that together, basically, if you run uh, the easy software stack, you have a host operating system, of course. On top of that, there's the file system layer, that's the CERN VMFS layer, that takes care of the distribution. Basically, you mount this repository from uh, a remote location. Then there's the compatibility layer. Again, this is similar to a container OS to provide the isolation from the host OS to provide a common set of uh, standard libraries in the container or in the compatibility layer. And then on top of that is the software layer where we install all of the scientific software. So things like Gromax, OpenFoam, TensorFlow, whatever you want to install. Um, and that last part is done with EasyBuild. It contains a module system so that you can easily uh, switch between version, different versions of the same software. Um, just as people are used to on an HPC system. Of course, if you would use Easy on a local machine or on a, um, a cloud node, this might be the first time that you encounter environment modules. Uh, but that's yeah, it's not a super complicated system to work with and just easily enables you to switch between two versions of Gromax or TensorFlow or whatever. Um, and all the way on the left, you see I put this reframe. Uh, reframe is a testing framework for software testing on HPC systems. Um, we can actually use it to test also the compatibility layer and in principle also the file system layer. But really the, the choice for reframe was made because of the software layer, because reframe enables you to do software testing at scale. So it can interact with batch systems uh, and really deploy a whatever multi-node job to test is the performance of this piece of software as expected and do I get the expected result. All right, so this is a little bit more about the file system layer. Um, so again, the file system layer is meant to globally distribute this software stack, right? In the middle, you have the stratum zero. The stratum zero is basically the master copy of this software stack. Anything that's in there, is that's what gets distributed. Around that, you see four stratum ones. Stratum ones hold identical copies of the stratum zero. So the only thing they do is mirror the stratum zero. If we want to deploy new software, that means we need to deploy it on the stratum zero, and then it automatically gets mirrored to the stratum once. Outside of that ring, uh, that's where a couple of proxies are. So you have a uh, reverse proxy, a forward proxy. You can have a proxy server in between. You can also directly connect your system to a stratum one. Uh, it depends a little bit on what kind of performance you want and how, how much effort you want to spend in setting this up. Uh, of course, the advantage of, of the proxies in between, if you have, for example, an HPC cluster, it probably makes sense to have a, a proxy inside your HPC cluster uh, for performance reasons, or maybe even a full stratum one. Um, and as is indicated here, in the end, you can use this on any system you want, right? So you could have an HPC cluster that is connected to a proxy that is connected to another proxy and that is then connected to the stratum one. You could have a cloud node that goes through the same but it could also be an end user who just runs a laptop and wants to connect directly. So there's multiple levels of caching there to make sure that it's always available and to make sure that it's relatively performant. So then there's the compatibility layer. Um, let me check what they want to say about this. Uh, yeah, so basically it uses Gen2 Prefix, which is a Linux OS. It installs in a particular prefix. Uh, so this whole operating system is installed in a non-standard prefix. And basically all of the stuff that we compile on top of that with the, in the software layer is linked against uh, this Gen2 prefix layer. Um, there's limited, uh, it's limited to low-level stuff. So anything that's higher level we would build in a software layer, right? But uh, the low-level stuff is in a compatibility layer. 
Um, we need multiple compatibility layers because we want to support different processor families. So there's a compatibility layer for x86-64, a different one for PowerPC, a different one for ARM, etc. And basically this levels the playing field for any software that, that we built on top of it. And then finally there's the software layer, that's the top level of the stack uh, that provides all the scientific software applications. Um, we optimize there for specific CPU architectures, so for example for Intel Haswell, for AMD, Zen 2, for etc. Whatever you want, for ARM. Um, it leverages uh, the libraries from the compatibility layer, as I mentioned, so not from the host OS. And right now it's installed with EasyBuild and it includes environment modules um, which are created by LMOD. So there's an LMOD module environment which is part of the compatibility layer and that basically gives you the, the software layer. And then finally, the best subdirectory from this. So basically, you have a lot of copies of this software layer, right? Each of them optimized for a different microarchitecture. And then the best subdirectory of those for your current system gets selected by Archspec. All right. So as I mentioned, testing is always important. But if you have a lot of users, it's even more important. And if you have one single software stock stack, you're definitely going to have a lot of users. Um, so it's even more so. Um, and we're trying to develop a test suite that is completely portable, which is a challenge, uh, because you don't know in advance which system it's gonna run on, how much memory you have, what kind of accelerators you have, et cetera. But we're trying to create a, a portable test suite with reframe that could be run on any of the end user systems. So this could be a cluster, it could be a local laptop. Um, the reason we chose Reframe, as I mentioned, is because it can interact with batch systems. So it's pretty easy if you want to run a multi-node uh, test at scale. And we have a more extensive talk on this uh, this Friday. I, I have a talk at 9.30 in the morning. And then we go a lot more in depth into how to write these portable tests. And I will also show this to you. And I will hope that you can actually try it yourself as well. Let's see how far we get. So what is the current status? The most recent pilot version is, uh, um, is built in December of 2021. Uh, we would really like to update that, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, it's a proof of concept, right? This is not something that, that I would definitely recommend for production, uh, but that is something that we're working towards. Um, but if you have enthusiastic tech savvy users that want to try something new, then by all means have them try it. Um, we have a lot of Ansible playbooks that can do things like set up a Stratum 1, set up a Stratum 0, etc. The Stratum 0 currently is running at the University in Groningen in the Netherlands, and we have four Stratum 1 servers in this, uh, uh, as part of this whole CERN VMFS infrastructure. Uh, the software that's in there is pretty limited, right? Because it's just, yeah, it's just a proof of concept. So we have the, the main HPC candidates, Gromax, OpenFoam. TensorFlow, etc. Those are in there, so you can play around and experience what it's like to use this software ecosystem. And as mentioned, the supported hardware targets right now uh, they're listed below here. So it's it's a well reasonably long list, I think. Uh, and I guess we'll uh, we'll expand this in the future even. So what are the benefits of having a system like this? Well, for HPC support teams, it's, it's quite trivial, right? If we can share this software deployment effort, uh, that makes it more efficient. That saves us time. That means we can do other things. Uh, it also creates a platform for knowledge sharing on how do we deploy the software efficiently, right? It means that we're um, a big party, also relevant for, for example, developers to talk to, right? Uh, if we say, hey, we're from Easy, we want your help in really getting the absolute most out of the software installation that we create from your software. A developer will be much more motivated to talk to us if we can say, you know, we're actually servicing, I don't know, tens or hundreds of HPC centers rather than we're just one, right? For scientists, it's also really nice because it makes it much easier to transition from one system to another, uh, from the local laptop to a cloud node to an HPC cluster. It makes it much easier to also adopt newer architectures, right? Because you don't need to learn how to properly optimize for an ARM architecture. If you're not familiar with ARM, you can just run the same script that you were using uh, on a different architecture, also on the ARM architecture, because the software is already deployed for you. Uh, reproducibility could also be an interesting factor for users. Um, you can actually run the exact same run as another scientist did, because you have 
uh, access to the exact same software installation. Uh, and that could be a very interesting use case for, uh, for scientists to try and replicate each other's work. And finally, of course, for hardware providers and funding agencies, I guess they should be interested, and they are interested, uh, because it allows you to do more scientific work with the same amount of hardware if you have this, these properly optimized software installations. Of course, there's many, many more benefits. We have a use cases talk at two, so uh, I'm sure you're going to hear more about it then. And with that, I would like to wrap up with a set of links. Uh, if you want to read more about it, we've written a paper, uh, which is open access, so you can uh, you can read more about it. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned, by all means, join our Slack if you have questions, if you want to interact with us. And uh, thank you for your attention. Are there questions? Maybe first in the room and then online? Questions from the room? No? You're mostly familiar with this stuff anyway, I guess. <laughs> you were mentioning the optimizing the software itself. Is there a benefit for trying to optimize the dental layer? Um, I don't think there's much benefit there because we only use the lowest level libraries from the Gentoo layer, right? Uh, pretty much anything, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Ken, but pretty much anything except glibc is built by EasyBuild in the software layer anyway. So that is already, like anything above that is already optimized. That's actually the one thing where we may want to reconsider looking at it because glibc is used everywhere. And some of the basic math functions, for example, come from GDPC. Yeah. The, the libm library comes from there. Um, now, what GDPC has, has evolved into recently is that they are, they've made themselves aware of the differences between CPUs. So they have a different code path for AVX512, for example, and it's essentially a fat binary. So in, in that sense, it should be okay to just have it like we have now without having any performance impact. Maybe that's something to be looked at again. But I think that's really the only place where we're relying on something that comes from the OS, but then from our controlled compatibility layer, everything else is basically um, optimized by EasyBuild. And, and there is a couple of tools in the compatibility layer that you might just want to use as a user, right? The, the almost module command comes from there. Editors. Uh, there it doesn't matter what the performance is, right? So yeah, there's some practical stuff in there, but they're not performance critical. The Gentoo prefix is already uh, compiled by ourselves as well. So you are now, so we are now compiling it with generic plugs, I guess, and it's used, it, the same prefix is used for all the different architectures. Yes. That's what it does by default. It builds itself generic, but it uses it. Because we could have a different prefix per CPU application. We could. Yeah. If, there's, if there's a reason to do so, we could. As far as I know currently, I don't think there's a reason to. You will probably get the same glibc binary, whether you build on Haswell or on Spanish. But maybe that's something to be looked at at some point. Yeah, yeah could be interesting. Or, or the compiler you use for building the compatibility layer could be important as well. So we're, we're in full control over that. And Gentoo gives you the, uh, the freedom to pick a very recent compiler or pick an older compiler. And there's a benefit of both in some sense. And, and it's already compiled by ourselves. Yes, and we, yeah, we, we can experiment with that and, and just uh, see what happens. We have more homework to do, but I think before <laughs> you come to that point, but yeah, that's something we can always reconsider. Yeah. Maybe at, at some point we, the GLIPC goes up to the software layer level. That's possible as well. Um, anyway, more questions. Yes. <clears throat> um, will you have support for vendor specific compilers for each? or individual CPUs? That's a great question. So uh, already it's a bit difficult for me to answer because you know I don't represent easy personally, right? We are all easy. So I guess it depends on what we need. Uh, if we have a need for vendor specific compilers to be supported, then maybe yes, but of course you have the licensing uh, question, right? Maybe that cannot be distributed publicly, but maybe you build on top of the public easy stack, your own local, uh, stack with 
um, these vendor specific compilers with uh, or maybe with uh, proprietary software in there etc that that could be an option yeah so uh, because the intel compilers the one api and the aocc from amd are already let's say yeah available for uh, for everybody yes so th hence my question uh, if we are well we can support it but if we can distribute it it's i don't know exactly yeah, that's. I guess that's a legal question. I don't. I don't have the answer to that. Like, what the legal implications of those are. <laughs> I mean, you can look a little bit at what Compute Canada does. Um, so they distribute the runtime for the Intel compilers, but not the compilers themselves, right? So you'd be subject. Something I'll bring up in the when I talk about when I talk about GPU support, you can't distribute the MVCC compiler because of U.S. export regulations. Um, so if we can't do that, it's the same situation with something like the Intel compilers and things like that. They also are subject to uh, the export regulations as well, or at least I don't know those details. I'm not a lawyer, right? But that's kind of the excuse you get a lot, right? Um, but yeah, there are other things you can do. So, so if they're not, if your users are not compiling the code, you can you you can probably with permission from them, you can distribute the runtime, and then they can run code that was compiled with that compiler. So, so something like that would be possible. So what we would do is on inside, when we're building the software, of course, we will have the compilers available, but what we actually ship will be something that's pared down to the bare essentials. That could be a model that we could take. If you look beyond compilers, there's actually a broader problem there because not all the software we install on HPC is, is open source. Like you, you mentioned Vasp already, there's other examples as well where you get the source code, but you're not allowed to redistribute that in any any shape or form. And the the model we see there in, in the long term is that Easy could basically give you everything that's possible and you build your stuff on top if you need to or if you want to. You you could rebuild TensorFlow with different optimizations if, if you want to or with different features enabled and just have that as a local installation on top of Easy, just on the side in some sense. But that's definitely a model that's possible, and I think that would still be a big help uh, compared to controlling everything yourself. Because you already have all of the dependencies available then, which is a long list for something like TensorFlow. <laughs> well, actually, you just mentioned you closed, and you, you can only have... So yeah, for, for compilers, it's different, yeah. Then Well, you sort of require compilers to create these specific versions. So there is a way around this too, right? So and that's something I'll cover when I talk about the CUDA support. And um, so we do have a way around this problem as well. And there is a way you can do that with clever use of, there's some clever things you can do. Of course, uh, my perception on this one is if we're not providing the compilers, how are we going to be able to test it? How do we know that what we get out of the, uh, out of the sausage machine is a sausage? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, we are going to uh, provide the open source compilers, right? GCC yeah. and stuff like that. So oh, that yeah. but we I can mean for anything else. So if, if it's for scientific reproducibility reasons, is there, um, doesn't that put the whole reproducibility? No, so then, in the so then it depends on if you can distribute the runtime, you can still yeah. run it, right? Then we can test it. Sort of. Um, then maybe I'm not sure on your question. Like, what are you lacking then? Well, I mean... I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that the compiler is good. I'm assuming that what you get out is what you put in. Ah, right. So yes. testing the compiler itself. Yes. Yes, no. I mean, I guess you would then test the compiler indirectly through the software like that was built with it, and does that produce the results that you expect, right? Right. That can be a bit of a problem. It's certainly a hole. But we can still, yeah, I, can, I guess we can still test compilers more directly in our own C CI pipeline, just not distributed. I mean, you do have the recipe. You do know which compiler it was. You're, I guess, yes, you are making. I mean, everything is checksummed, so even the compiler itself is checksummed. You don't know the internals of what that compiler is doing, no. So, yeah. But you do have. You are still building on top of the prefix layer, right? So if that's available to you, you have the same operating system, same checksum compiler, same hardware, let's say, and uh, potentially. Yeah, I mean, okay. I mean, I don't know. You could probably be very clever and figure a way that that 
might not work, but it's, 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 it's a pragmatic approach to, to geeks, right? Geeks goes, puts it to the extreme, let's say. They, they, they reset the system clock to January 1st, 1970, because they know if you build on a different time, you're going to get a different binary because the, the time is, is recorded, right? So they, they do very hardcore stuff like this. That may be a, a bit beyond the pragmatic approach, <laughs> and, and maybe not. I mean, the, the, there's very good reasons why they do this. They want full reproducibility, like bitwise reproducibility. I'm not sure we, we want that, first of all. We have bigger problems to, to worry about. And if it's really useful in the end to go to that extreme, maybe there's a middle ground there that makes enough sense. I've had discussions with the geeks <laughs> people on this. I've, I, we've invited the geeks people to the Unisable user meeting at some point because they were close or uh, or they had a meeting. Uh, we usually tie it close to FOSDEM and they're at FOSDEM all the time. So we had, I think, two or three talks by, by Piotr and by Ricardo. And we had very interesting discussions there. We, it, very different views on things, but very interesting discussions and things that make you realize, okay, maybe we're not going far enough, but we, we want to go that far, and is that practical in an HPC setting? And there's, there's a whole bunch of things going on. They, so they have very good points, but sometimes difficult to achieve in, in practice. Yeah. 